Okay, hello everyone. This is going to be my amateur attempt to describe the APX firing mechanism in detail and hopefully get a close-up video of some of the uh, tangen tangential features as well as the internal components and how they move and interface together. If you want to look at some really excellent still photos taken, you can check out the Beretta Forum FAQ on the APX, and they have a disassembly sequence listed in there that has excellent close-up photos of the entire firing chassis and other components of the APX that I think will complement this video very well. So in this video, I want to, in particular, discuss and look at a few of the parts of the gun. In particular, the uh, disassembly latch, the firing mechanism, which includes both the trigger and the firing pin block safety, as well as the operation of the decocking button here. So let's go ahead and disassemble the firearm and take a look at all of those pieces. So the disassembly procedure, I'm going to go ahead and use the decocking button to illustrate its function, where we have the decocking button here. Pull back on the slide slightly, then press into the decocking button, which will release the striker. Following that, we can simply press on the takedown lever, rotate it down, and the slide will come apart. So the main parts that we're interested in are these uh, rear side components. So a few of the interesting things that I noted about the internal of the slide, some of the pieces you want to look out for are this um, cut here on the slide right here, the firing pin block safety, the striker, and then this wall, which was curious to me, but you'll see why that's relevant a little bit later. And then otherwise, the slide looks very similar to anything else you would have recognized. We also have this ramp here on the design. And then everything forward looks pretty straight forward, fairly normal. And this is a two-piece design where, or not a two-piece, but sort of a two-height design where you've got this angled ledge and then a flat ledge here. So this piece here is the firing pin block and this is under its own spring pressure. So there is a small, I believe it's a, I, I don't know the correct name for it, but it's a pyramid style spring that's pressed up and down and this operates under its own spring pressure. And then you have a striker spring here, which compresses or presses against the firing pin. And those are the um, two of the three springs in this slide. In addition, there is a spring on the fronts of the firing pin as well, or the striker as well. So there are three springs in total in this design and the striker is a single unit and then the striker spring is a captured uh, polymer assembly. Additionally the extractor has its own spring setup but I'm not going to be discussing that in any great detail. So now what I found interesting about the internals of the APX chassis, the frame, 
was the consistency of reliance on what I would deem thick, um, sort of blocky components combined with cylinders. So if you look at the slide, let me see if I can get this in focus for you. There are really um, three main cylinders. The rear cylinder, this uh, cylinder here, and then there's this, um, actually I guess there are four, and then there's this, this cylinder here on which the barrel locks and unlocks. And then inside of here, it's difficult to get light going to the right place for this. Let me see if I can adjust this a little bit. You can see inside of that is the trigger spring. And so there are really only two springs in this design. The spring back here and the spring in the front. And the front spring and the rear spring are both uh, torsion springs, I think they're called. And then you have the trigger in here. It, there's a leg right in here of the spring. Well, it's kind of dark, but it's difficult to see, but you can kind of see there there's a spring there that uh, controls the trigger reset or the pressure on the initial trigger. And then back here, there are two components that are connected to this rear spring. This uh, one pin here is just the disassembly pin and serves as a latch for the torsion spring and holds the rear of the modular chassis together. The firing striker um, sear, for lack of a better word, is the dark unit. And then the firing pin block lever is the silver unit there. And they rotate. All of these devices seem to operate on a rotational principle. So if we were to press down on this, we notice that it just rotates along that spring. And you'll notice that these two pieces are separate from one another. So there's a small bit of space where the firing pin block lever can move independently of the sear here. And then another part to notice is right in here, you have the trigger bar. And this is on the outside of the chassis and controlled has a has an upward pressure on it from a spring inside here right in here um, very dark in there and difficult to see but if you look at the pictures then you'll be able to see in more detail the spring pressing up on the trigger bar here and then we have this piece, which is interesting because this piece is just connected to all of, is just an extension of these pieces here. So when the gun fires, you have a standard trigger flap or dingus or whatever you want to call it here. And this impedes rearward motion of the trigger by contacting that polymer frame surface right there. So if you press the trigger this way, 
the dingus will, or the blade safety will run up against the back of the frame up here. Additionally, there is sort of an over travel stop cut in the frame back here so that if the trigger is pulled all the way to the rear, you get a trigger stop right there. Uh, and then looking at the internals and the movement, if we were to pull the trigger without the blade safety disengaged, you can see a slight movement on the firing pin block lever. And all of the action of the trigger is transferred from the trigger through the trigger bar to that firing pin block lever. And then that lever is what applies force onto the sear, the back. So when you go through the full press of the trigger, it rotates like so. And from the wear you can see on the sear, I'm calling it the sear, I don't know what the correct term for it is, you can see that the firing, the striker here interfaces with the Let's see if I can get these both in frame at the same time, yeah. Interfaces with that um, small pyramid and the most of the trigger feel that you experience up to the release of the striker is contact here where the sear rotates down like this and it rotates down at an angle, as you can see. And there appears to be a slight rearward movement of the sear, but from everything I can tell, because of the angled interface, there's very little rearward motion of the striker. So I would tend to think of this as a fully tensioned striker if I had to put it in one category or the other, even though there might be some slight rearward motion. So if anyone feels creep on their trigger, it may be because this part is not cleaned enough to give you a smooth, a smooth interface when the sear is being released because there is a small amount of travel along that surface that has to go on the trigger when it's released. But it also explains why the take up is so smooth on and almost non-existent on the trigger because everything is controlled by only that single front trigger return spring up until the point at which we interface with the sear and then we'll basically hit the wall at that point and go from there. So there are really two distinct phases, even though they are relatively short phases of the uh, trigger pull. And that pretty much covers how the trigger works during the initial firing stages. The trigger lever here you'll see presses up and this will press up on the firing pin block and let's see come on yeah there we go this will press up on the firing pin block and and release so i don't see any way for the trigger to be released um with the, uh, or the striker to be released when pulling the trigger without the firing pin block being lifted up. However, the, it is possible to, if the firing pin 
or sorry, this the sear were to drop here without the trigger being pressed, then it's possible for the firing pin lever not to go up fully and disengage the firing or striker block, which is I think the way that it's designed to prevent, uh, to pr make sure that you, you don't have that um, firing pin or the striker block being disabled every single time the sear drops, even if you had an inertia drop of the sear. So under reset, this is the interesting thing, is when you have reset, that that curve that we talked about here on the outside of the slide, that connects in with the trigger bar. And so if the trigger bar is rearward like this, and the slide retracts to the rear, this will get pressed down and it will snap over the lever that connects to this bar and the spring pressure from the this torsion spring in here will return the sear back to its upward position even with the trigger pulled and then when we release the trigger the trigger bar pops back up from the rear. And then you have your gun reset and all ready to go. So that's the basic firing operation. I know it's a bit plotting, but I'm trying to be a little meticulous here if I can, as best I can. And there's a better, better view of the leg of this spring here that connects everything together and holds everything down. This also appears to be the same, this spring in the front is the same spring both for the trigger and for the um, slide stop slide release. So you can see the leg sticking out there on the slide stop, which presses down on it and controls that, as well as a small leg, which is which you basically can't see from here on the trigger itself. So that one spring is responsible for both operations in this firearm. Now, decocking, I wasn't quite sure how they had achieved the decocking feature until I took this apart and studied it a little more closely and now it's fairly straightforward and in fact I find that the entire operation of this pistol is fairly straightforward and I'm surprised that it operates on so few basic principles and that the parts are so open and easy to see how they work when you actually take this apart. There's really there's no hidden part or hidden function in the gun that's operating. Almost all the parts are big, chunky, and very easy to see when you when you look at them. But the decocker, I know a lot of people were afraid that the decocker button could get accidentally activated when the slide was in battery. But the way the decocker button works is that you, when you press on the decocker button. Let's see if I can do this all. I don't know if I can get this all in close on the camera. It's like, uh, we'll flip it around here. There we go. So when we press on this button here, all it really does, it's just a direct connection to the sear. And so when we press on it, all it does 
is move the sear to the left. And that will be enough to release the striker. Now, if you could do this at any point, you'd basically be relying only on the firing pin block as your safety when releasing the striker on a loaded chamber. And you could imagine accidentally activating it somehow through inertia or something else. Like if the slide fell down this way very hard, you might activate that button, release your striker, and then you'd have a, a dead trigger. But the way Beretta gets around this is with this wall here. So this wall physically prevents the de uh, decocker button from moving towards the left side of the pistol while the slide is in battery. So in order for the striker to be deactivated in that direction, in addition to overcoming the spring pressure of that torsion compression spring, you also have to move the slide rearward enough so that it will clear here. Now in addition to clearing that wall, that will also reduce the striker tension and will greatly reduce the amount of spring force applied to the striker after it's been um, after it clears that wall and you will also be taking the firearm out of battery when you're doing that and so that's a really simple easy way to decock the pistol and it allows it to be resistant to dropping and releasing the striker um, through inertia while still providing you with the decocking capability. And it also is done without really adding to the parts count of the pistol. There are no additional parts necessary in order to provide for the decocking feature. Instead, all of the decocking features are available simply because of the way that all the main components interface with one another and the fact that the main sear here is on that spring which can serve both as a rotational torsion spring and as a compression spring and so it can move in two to it can move in both at, in a circle and uh, left to right so two main axes I suppose or along the same axes in different directions for different purposes and I think that is everything to know about the way this whole pistol is put together internally. Um, one of the things I see is people having, when they first start disassembling it, they kind of have trouble figuring out how to take this front pin out. And I don't really think that it's particularly difficult, but the way it's designed is with multiple different points. So if, when the lever is all the way in, it will not just rotate and it has a little shelf there for the barrel. And it also has a flat shelf here, you can see it when I rotate it down, where the uh, recoil spring can interface and lock, uh, and lock into. So it serves as sort of the buffer area for the for the recoil spring when it's locked into position. Now when you press the button that clears enough of the the that clears the stop for the rotation and allows it to rotate down. Now if it's rotated down it can't go out any further. It's prevented from from going out any further on the pistol. But if rotated back up after it's cleared that point, it has all the clearance it needs to come out of the pistol. You can see the design here. So it has multiple stops built into it. So then when reassembling it, rather than having to shimmy it around, you simply line it up straight, press down, and that's your reassembly position. And it automatically returns to the upward position 
based on the spring pressure of the recoil spring, which applies forward pre pressure here and pushes it into position like this. So when it's unlocked and the recoil spring begins to press against it, it wants to naturally rotate up and into the pistol. And that's how it gets its sort of automatic locking feature, which I thought was kind of a dirt simple way of making it work. So if you, if you examine the internals here then one final time, it really is very, very simple as an operation. And you only have really two main springs plus, plus a trigger bar spring. And those two main springs are responsible for, one of them is responsible for the slide stop and the trigger here. And the other is responsible for the sear and the decocking feature as well as the um, striker block lever. Now, unlike the Glock system, there is no shelf preventing an inertial drop of the sear here. So I can freely, without pressing the trigger, I can freely release the striker here in any way that I would like. And the question then, which I don't have a good answer to, is how they prevent the sear from releasing easily. Now one of that would be that there's a fairly strong spring there preventing that. The, uh, the design is oriented around a six pound trigger pull, so that's their expectation on the spring there. And then in addition to that, you have the fact that even if the if there is pressure here on the the sear pressing down, if there's force enough to press this down, there's probably also force pressing the striker pin lever in the opposite direction. Since they both rotate around the same cylinder, my thought is that the they will have a tendency to cancel each other out as far as forces go if there's enough downward pressure to release the sear. There might also be enough or possibly more pressure on the lever to, to keep the sear in place. And that could be a combination of the design since the lever appears to be a slightly bigger part that has more stuff sticking out and thus maybe it has a stronger levering effect. I don't know all the details on that. It would be interesting to see. Um, but that means that in theory, I suppose there must be some way to get an inertial drop of the sear. But if you do get an inertial drop of the sear, then the, the theory is that this lever will not be pressed up far enough to deactivate the striker block, which will then serve as your secondary safety measure in that case. And that is about it, I think. Um, I mean, other than to say I really like the design of the mag release on this thing, uh, because I like how they have that built-in over-insertion stop in the magazine well there, which prevents over-inserting the magazine and the triangle design of the catch means that the catch isn't sort of sliding in and getting stopped at that point by the force of the magazine. So you're not, you're basically applying almost zero or very, very little vertical force or twisting force against the magazine release button. So that little tab in my opinion, has a much lower chance of breaking off or breaking because of inserting the magazine too hard. Since the, um, the, it's a gentle ramp that pushes the, a gentle ramp that pushes the 
lever out of the way and then it just snaps back into empty space and then there's nothing that's pushing against that um, lever again unlike with a slotted magazine design as opposed to the front release and then you rely on that those two wedges above the magazine release to prevent over insertion okay now as far as durability goes to me the points which you see the most wear on those are the ones taking a lot of the force um, the this lever here is obviously going to be containing the recoil spring force and then you have the main unlocking force all being applied to this chunky bar here um, I'd be interested to know I don't know if that's replaceable or not I'm also interested to know the types of force that are being applied to that since that seems to be the one place where you'll get the most force applied to it otherwise I don't think that much force is being applied to any of the rest of the parts and all the parts are pretty chunky so I find it interesting that the a lot of the parts are kind of squat stout and um, squarish with cylindrical movement axes on this design versus the Glock design which tends to in my opinion favor the plate or more elongated flat um, sheet style parts which um, I, I don't think that you can make an argument for one being better than the other necessarily but I just think that it's an interesting design motif that appears in both of these actions uh, that I find rather enjoyable from a, an aesthetic point of view so anyways uh, I know this is a long video and not of super high quality but I hope that it's enough quality for people to see how the whole thing works uh, hope you enjoyed